Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Design Sense, where we say if it doesn't make sense, you shouldn't be spending dollars and cents on it. And I'm Rod Gantis, and I've got my co-host here, Bill Elson. Bill, how are Hello you? Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Who nice to you, see you, Rod. You as well. Good to see you, my you. friend. Uh, who do you have for us today? You always have great guests for us. Well, today's guest uh, is one of the very exciting founders of West Edge Design Fair here in Los Angeles. She started in uh, Chicago at the Merchandise Mart, working for a company that promoted design events. And then she was brought to New York City with that company where she worked on the Architectural Digest design show, which is very prestigious. Yeah. And she had the vision to bring that type of design fair to Los Angeles about uh, 2005. West Edge Design Fair. So who, 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 who is this lady? Um, this is Megan Riley and she's coming to us from Florida. Uh, she might even be on the beach because you know the beaches are open. So let's see. Where's Ma Here's Megan. She's Hi with guys. us. Today. Hi, Megan. There How are she you? is. Good things. How are you both? Hi, Megan. Hi, Thanks Bill. For joining us. We're Thanks for having we're, me. We're doing. We're doing <laughs> well. Uh, Megan, um, again, Bill mentioned that you're in Florida right now, but uh, I know that you reside in Santa Monica. You're in. You're on West Coast. All right. Yeah. But, but you've been. You've been all over. Like you've. You've lived in Chicago. You've lived in New York. So yeah, I've been lucky. I've, I've lived in a lot of great cities. Um, I actually got my start in the design industry in Chicago. I'm originally from the Midwest and uh, had the opportunity to work for Merchandise Smart Properties at the Merchandise Smart in Chicago, which is um, such an iconic design center. So that's really where I cut my teeth. Um, and then they relocated me to New York uh, to produce the Architectural Digest design show. So um, I was in New York for 10 years. Um, and then my business partner and I decided to launch West Edge here in, uh, in Los Angeles. So Megan, I, I know you, you, you've been involved with, like you said, the Architectural Digest show, but you've also been involved with Neocon, which is basically more of a commercial hospitality, which is sort of where I have cut my teeth. Um, and the shows have different characteristics, I think, just in terms of the people that they, that the attendees, the way that they're structured, maybe, right? I think basically also their location drives some of that. Um, right? Definitely, definitely. You know, Neocon, um, Neocon's flagship is Chicago. When I was working on the Neocon family of shows, we also had a, a version in Baltimore, a version in LA, and then mm -hmm. one in Toronto. So um, Neocon leans uh, more commercial, as you mentioned. It's a contract furnishings trade show right. and really caters strictly to the design trade. So architects, facility managers, interior designers. Um, and, uh, you know, the Architectural Digest design show uh, has a residential appeal, mm -hmm. uh, catering to the readership of the magazine and the advertising base of Architectural Digest, among other things. So um, the AD design show was really and is still a hybrid model where the audience is both design trade, but also the homeowner or consumer audience as well. So a little bit different in that sense. Now, does the AD show uh, ever happen outside of New York? It, it does not. No, it does not. It's um, been in, uh, I think they are in their 20th year, um, and it has been New York um, from the get-go since we launched it. Yeah, it, 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 it seems fitting that that would be where they would have it, and I think to your, to your point, the mix is, it makes perfect sense for me. Like, you've got a lot of people that are very much into that. There's, a, there's affluence and the ability to basically be excited by new things and new innovations so that Makes perfect sense for me. Now, with that being said, I got to tell you, I mean, when I attended West Edge, it's got its own character too. Yeah. So, you know, going back to the point about the AD show, um, we were getting conversations, having questions so frequently when we were living in New York. Why don't you guys do something like this in LA? We'd love oh. to see a, a high-end design fair in Los Angeles or on the West Coast. So that was really the driver or the impetus for uh, us to launch West Edge as our own entity. So um, we felt that there was a hole in the market and an opportunity um, to really cater to the West Coast market. And so many of our clients um, were interested in the West Coast, didn't really know how to navigate the West Coast and Los Angeles specifically. So um, that was the driver for launching West Edge. And you're right, we have tried to make it um, its, own, it, its own unique event in the sense that it's uh, California cool, a little bit more casual, 
Um, we did, uh, you know, decide to keep the event neutral um, as far as media partnerships. We work with multiple media partners. Mm -hmm. Architectural Digest um, was actually the first media partner that jumped on board with us when we launched. Um, and it's been, it's been great. It's been growing year over year and uh, definitely has kind of found a niche. Can you maybe describe further for our listeners the vibe, the different vibe, I think. Don't they have a panel, yeah. from what I've read in New York, of, of the top designers that give that are there and you can ask them questions because it's open to the public right yeah, yeah it is op it is open to the public um we have always been we like to say we're the anti-trade show so at west edge being the uh -huh. anti-trade show um we've always leaned away from traditional convention facility or convention centers um and so we run west edge design fair at a venue called the barker hangar in Santa Monica, which is an, an airport, a private airplane hangar. So yeah, it's, it's really, really fabulous. Cool. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. It's um really raw, industrial, um, edgy to appeal to the the vibe of West Edge. Uh, we leave the hangar doors wide open, and so we really try to create this indoor outdoor um, cool weekend experience. And we're fortunate at the Barker Hangar that we do have access to a lot of the outdoor space. So we, um, we kind of connect the hangar itself with an outdoor lounge and we build out uh, other aspects of the fair using the outdoor space. And, um, you know, knock on wood, we've been so fortunate each October to have great weather. So that's oh, yeah. one and, of the great things yeah. about living in, in, in Southern, Southern California, California yeah. of course. You, you know, Megan, also have great parking too. Lots of parking. A lot of we lots do. of parking. Yeah. We do. Which, We've loved the venue. The venue um has has gotten such great feedback from both attendees and exhibitors. And you know, the other thing about that venue is that it's so easy to get in and out of from yeah. an exhibitor perspective. Um, you can bring in your own labor crews. You can kind of you know bring your own teams, hire your own teams to fabricate your displays, and it's very different in that sense than a than a you know convention center vibe. Well, which you, where you have like if you're in Vegas, for example, there's 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 people that you have to use for setup, you have to use for receiving, and et cetera, so forth and so on. Yeah, you know, it, it, Megan, the vibe too, if I may, the vibe also was very very LA. Like you had the, from the very beginning when you walked up, it had more of an after party. Uh, almost, almost, it almost felt like a Vanity Fair after Oscar party kind of vibe. Like you, you, you no. the entry, the approach. I mean, I don't know if that was where you were going for. The way you're nodding your head is it maybe. Is. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. You know, we want to we want to create a fun environment, and um, you know, we've tried to do that year over year. So the last thing we want people to feel like they're doing is going to another work event. Right. Um, and you know, no, a lot was, of times when you're when you're really, in a, it was really a lot of fun. You had the DJ. You had the big open area, and then people had to walk down a little hallway, like a maze, with, and you had the greenery, and then poof, you came in. Yeah. It was really spectacular, yes. Thank really. you. Well, you know, we, we work with so many creative people, and we, we try to carve out different areas where, you know, a landscaping company can mm -hmm. get involved and create that red carpet or green carpet walkway that you're talking about, Bill. Right. Um, and... I've gone to several trade shows where you really don't know if it's 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. because you're in a, a white <laughs> box and you, you can't see outside. So we really do try to play up that California cool vibe, indoor-outdoor environment. We have cocktail bars uh, throughout the facility. We have a big opening night party, um, you know, with music and, and catering and all sorts of things that really make it engaging and, and kind of bring the fun factor. Yeah, it was it was more of a mixer vibe. It was more of an after party vibe than it was like an a, a uh, an expo, if you will. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and yeah. That's what we're going for. That's definitely you know, like I said, um, the enjoyment, the entertainment, and engagement is all part of the um, you know part of the the feel and the look that West Edge is is kind of carved out for itself. You know, the, 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 it also carried through, Megan, to the actual exhibitors. If I, you know, if, I don't even know that the word exhibitor really applies to them. They're more like participants almost, or like, you know, vignettes, if you will. Yeah, but well, we, we, we do call them exhibitors. They are our exhibitors. And 
Um, we have been very conscientious about how we curate the fair. So, you know, we have a combination of larger uh, design brands that maybe are more well known, as right. well as independent designers and makers who are doing limited edition custom work and perhaps, um, you know, flying under the radar and not mm -hmm. as well known in the design community. So it's a great platform to really um, cater to all segments of the, of the market. I'll, I'll you tell have you, some very, very interesting uh, products, some interesting vendors, not what you would typically see at, in my opinion, a trade show, you know. Yeah. So many of the markets and everything, but the West Edge was very uh, spectacular. Lots of pop and fun and the music and everything. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah, Megan, you're probably familiar with this being from that you've spent time in Chicago with, with uh, Nikon. There used to be a show that used to take place at Navy Pier, and it was called Sofa. I don't know yeah. if you, do you remember Sofa. I, I do. I remember it very well. Sculptural objects and fine art, or, or some, or furniture yes. and arts, or something like that. Yep. And it was an odd duck show. It was sort of like curated gallery art and art that's applied on a larger scale. This was way before people were incorporating that sort of large scale public arts projects into commercial settings or hotel lobbies or whatever. And it was, it was almost, it was almost like, you know, Etsy on steroids. You had things that were like woven, you had leather work stuff. And then there was, there was, then, then Metropolis magazine, when it first came oh. out with the oversized print, and there was a section always in the back that was very interesting to me where you had, the equivalent of like business card advertising. It was teeny tiny stuff that was like all in the back. But when you look through that, it was all these little, you know, independent little workshops, these little artisan kind of, you know, people that are trying to provide alternative approaches, different looks, different takes on things that to your point, were not necessarily widely known, but they had something really interesting to offer. And so when I walked through West Edge, it was really funny because it, it reminded me, not in terms of the environment, but it reminded me of how it was curated. It was a re almost a ref almost a bit of sofa, a little of that metropolis kind of like on the fringe. And then you, like you said, you had some of these anchoring brands that are more well known. It was a beautiful mix, honestly. And then doing it as an evening event, kudos. I mean, that just out of the ballpark as far as I was concerned. Thank you. I mean, we we find that those boutique brands that you're speaking of. Yeah. Um, are doing some of the most interesting work. And it's the, the glass blower, the furniture maker, um, the sculptor, the lighting company um, yeah. that, you know, are doing one of a kind in custom work. And you really get to talk to the maker yeah. um, themselves and, and hear the inspiration, hear where the materials are coming from mm -hmm. and uh, get a better sense of what the products are all about. So I think one of the things we've experienced, both, you know, the design world, obviously the designers and architects are looking for those one of a kind mm -hmm. statement pieces that really make an environment so different and unique. Right. And then the homeowner consumer audience, um, everyone wants to be a connoisseur, right? Everyone wants to feel <laughs> yeah, like they know, in the know, they can speak about, you know, the, mm -hmm. the designer or maker who built the coffee table and, and have more of a personal connection with the products that, that they're purchasing. Right. And um, a lot of the, most of the things you'll see at West Edge are, you know, heirloom quality, they're, they're gonna last. They, they're a collectible piece that is going to grow with you right. in your space and grow with your family and hopefully be passed down. Now, uh, do you find that uh, because you've been around these so many years that you get these entrepreneurs, the design entrepreneurs, individual, like we were talking about the boutique designers coming to you, or do you reach out to them or is it just a back and forth? Um, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. We, we highly curate the fair. So we, we have a section called Made Modern, which is all oh, yeah. about right. the craftsmanship and uh, local you know, artisans from East Coast to West Coast and beyond. Um, and we, we source, we go out and try to discover those kind of brands. Um, but we also have a lot of referrals, word of mouth. The great thing about West Edge is that so many of our exhibitors become friendly with each other and they start Definitely. doing projects. You know, you always think of the benefit of doing a show because you're meeting attendees. Right. But what we often hear is 
an exhibitor whose neighbor you know, ends up being a collaborateur on future projects. Um, and that's always great to hear too, because um, that referral within the design community is something that's invaluable. So we do get uh, several participants recommending to other, other makers to, to get in touch with us and um, see how they can get involved, which is, is exactly what we want as well. Do you change yeah, the exhibitors yearly or do you like to have a mix of the same ones every year and new ones? How does that? You know, that's, a, that's a great question, Bill, and it's a combination. Um, we welcome return exhibitors, uh, of course. We really feel like we've built a community and we've built this West Edge family. So we'd like to see people returning. But at the same time, um, we have brands that are launching a product one year and maybe the next year they don't have a new product launch or they don't have um, you know, a big marketing rollout. Um, and that applies more to the bigger brands who, who do these you know, once every two or three year big new marketing campaigns and product launches. So it really just depends. I would say um, it's a combination of both. And we always try to add new elements to the mix. So whether that's new exhibitors coming in or new feature areas or new programming that really make it unique from one year to another. Megan, it's a bit, this is maybe a, a bit, bit of a bigger industry maybe question. Um, I've gone to so many exhibits that, you know, I basically got to the point where it's the same people, it's the same exhibitors. I might as well just go have drinks with my friends afterwards. Like, you know, it, and, and, and especially if it's laid out where it's just row upon row upon row, right? So the in, why I'm bringing that up is even prior to, you know, what we're going through right now is sort of a pandemic that kind of threw a curveball to a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the events industry was changing in terms of what the expectations were, the scale, the proportions. Can you speak to that? Because I think you have an interesting perspective having been involved in it for so long. Yeah. So what we're finding you know, it's, I go to big trade shows, obviously, um, in, in various places, Vegas, Orlando, and it, it can get to the point where you feel like you're seeing the same thing. After a few hours, your eyes just start to glaze over. Mm -hmm. you, you yes. know, it, it's almost overwhelming. So we really love the scale of our event, and we've gotten a lot of accolades um, that it's not too overwhelming. It's, it's not too challenging to navigate. Um, it's a boutique fair that's growing year over year, but we want to make it, again, manageable and a, a fair that you can get into within a day. Um, come back, you know, for programming and other things, but, you know, not necessarily a, a fair that you have to be at every day for four days and, and you still, um, you know, you just get exhausted by it. So I think one of the things we're also seeing is the regionalization of, of events. So. Um, and I think we're going to see that even more with COVID-19, perhaps right. people not wanting to travel as much um, and really catering, you know, to uh, growing, growing audiences in your backyard, but also creating a more reason for people to come. And I think we're in a great position in Santa Monica. We've always tried to market the destination as well. Um, you know, particularly people coming from New York and Chicago, we've got a lot in of- In October, yes. You know, who are like, oh, get me out of Chicago. I, you know, I'd love to be in Santa Monica, spend a, you know, a, tack on a little bit of vacation after the fair. And so that's been, um, you know, that's been another boon to, to our destination and to, to doing the event in Southern California. So, and how do you feel, because it's coming up in October, is that right. correct? Mm -hmm. So how is that working out with the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis? Yeah, what? so we are in touch with uh, the facility um, on a weekly basis. We're also um, very entrenched with the Santa Monica Chamber of Commerce and the city of LA. So I think the fair will look different for sure. Um, everyone is cognizant and being careful of the health and safety standards, standards that will be rolled out and really looking to city officials to help us navigate that. So um, like I said, we're fortunate that we have some outdoor space to also incorporate. And I think we may even utilize more of the outdoor environment, um, open air, you know, health and safety standards when you walk in, um, less uh, touch at the box office and surfaces and things like that. So we're definitely 
uh, considering all of those things and we'll be um, you know, making sure that health and safety is paramount to our plans in October. I would, I would, I would almost bet that you're going to have a, a heavier concentration of tech in this fair, maybe relevant to how it applies to either smart homes or to com like hands free or yeah, you know, right. I think I, I definitely see that as a trend. I also see um, health and wellness. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we're involved with the U.S. Green Buildings Council. Um, and they've been involved with programming at West Edge for the last couple of years, indoor air quality, health and wellness standards. And I think that more and more that those themes are becoming, you know, top of mind, not only for the design industry, but also for the homeowner. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do. I do a, a good amount of uh, spas and wellness centers and, you know, salons, hair salons and what have you and have done them on every level from owner operator to resort. And there has definitely been a shift. I don't know that the awareness on those, I think the focus right now is too much on the reopening versus the reimagining. But, mm -hmm. but I think it's just around the corner. And I think that reimagining becomes a very paramount thing to be engaged with when it becomes a differentiating factor and, and a competitive edge. Because if you are now appealing to people that have, for whatever reason, justifiable or otherwise, feeling a sense of lack of safety or exposure or vulnerability by being in an environment that has either a public venue or a large concentration of people, you, you cannot get away with just bare minimum compliances in order to appeal to them to come into your business. You're gonna have to go the extra mile. You're gonna have to have some quantifiable quality of air controls, uh, you know, and, and so forth and so on. Maybe, maybe, uh, uh, you, you know, your lighting has to be basically dealt with and more. So, so some of this lead information, some of that well building concepts will start to infuse not only commercial settings, not only hospitality setting, but actually to your point, residential as well. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so for sure. And, you know, the more that people have been staying at home, um, people are starting to really think about what they want their home to look like. You know, mm -hmm. everyone has to everyone I've been talking to now knows how to set themselves up to work from home or to have right. a more efficient workspace in their home. And, um, you know, I think we're going to see kind of that nesting, you know, people have been nesting over right. the last few months. And I think that that will bode well for a lot of the clients that we work with people wanting to, um, you know, make in small investments in their, in their living space, um, when they can and how they can. Yeah. Ven vendors or, 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 uh, exhibitors, that would have would that have an ability to scale like i remember one of your exhibitors last year who had a, i believe it was a company from italy and they had a steam tower that yeah. was you remember that that's the gb mm -hmm. yeah and and looking at it from my perspective of doing these sort of steam rooms and showers and we, tr we try to upgrade even in the case of like locker room situations where you have some maybe some body jets maybe you have some rain heads you know uh, when I saw that, it fa it was fascinating because we always get the call to bring some of that same vibe and experience into a residential environment. But the technology sometimes, the equipment requirements, the size of a, of a room to allocate for it becomes a little bit bird of a burden in order to achieve that. And here was a unit that was so smartly designed, so easy to install, attractive aesthetically, and scalable. And so I think anybody that has smart technology that's scalable, that is going to add to quality of life for people who have just spent 60 plus days in their homes and basically realize that maybe it's not exactly where it needs to be for me. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be a really big draw, I think, for people. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, there are a lot of companies who are being very innovative and in smaller technologies and in smaller space living. We had a an exhibitor with us last year called Natufia, who has created an indoor garden. So you think of- Oh, I remember them. Table. Now it's kitchen to table. You're able to grow your own fruits oh. and vegetables and herbs right in your own kitchen yeah. with a device and an appliance um, that lets you have an indoor garden. And I know so many of my friends are, you know, getting more into the gardening vibe <laughs> these days, um, you know, is a hobby given that they've been home and trying to grow their own food and and kind of take that health consciousness into consideration. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna come clean on that on that particular vendor. When I was there and I talked to them, you, you'll like this, I think, Megan. But it's a very California 
direction, right? I yeah. looked at I looked at it and I had just designed my very first dispensary. And I designed it almost with a hospitality and sort of a, mm -hmm. a spa-esque environment vibe. It was totally different from, you know, there was no separation walls that were basically verboting. There was no checkpoints that were almost like, you know, you're going to a doctor's office. It was very much more of a hospitality invite. But when I saw that vendor, and I think it was right after the steam, so I don't know whether it was just a combination effect, whatever, but when I saw that vendor, all I could think about is, oh my gosh, people can actually have a very high tech growing environment into their mm -hmm. homes for their own supply, own supply. Of, 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 of cannabis. And, and, and I remember talking to them and we had this very in-depth conversation regarding growing grapes and the amount of lighting. Also, it was fascinating. And, 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 and for those who didn't see this, I guess they're going to have to come to your, to the show this year or, or find out about this company. Yeah. It was so, it was so concise. It was so like fittable in an environment. It wasn't like this massive, huge, you know, like you, you look at some of these movies where they're like, you know, like, what is it? Weeds or whatever. It's like, it's like two houses worth of, you know, like just plant upon plant. This was a beautiful thing that anybody would want to have in their home. And it, like to your point, I can grow my own gardens. I can, I can, uh, I can have it in a controlled environment. That's the other thing too, right? So, uh, it's not only hygiene, but it's like exposure. Like, I mean, people are, are taking stuff that they received from, from Amazon and they're like spraying their boxes with Lysol and then leaving them in the garage to air before they bring them to their houses. It's a little extreme if you ask me, but mm. people, people's safety and sense of uh, sense of safety is going to be paramount of how they, we, how we proceed past this. Yeah. And it's funny. I, I think they got several um, comments um, uh, about the cannabis industry. They're a European well, brand. So um, uh, you know, maybe that created another thought process or a different functionality for their appliances. But um, I think it's a trend that we're going to see moving forward, people wanting to kind of take control uh, more so of, you know, what they can be self-sufficient with from a um, yeah. nutrition, culinary perspective. Right. Wellness perspective. Yeah, no, we we had a, we had a gentleman on for another uh, episode of the show, and we were talking about exactly like what is, are they seeing? They're in a uh, they're in a, in a in a custom cabinetry basically space, and they uh, he was talking about the office, like you mentioned, and that that office is no longer just a sort of an afterthought room where you know or a man cave, if you will, of some sort. It's actually a functional thing that has to basically not only operate in a vacuum of being in your home but it also has to be a connecting pod to any mm -hmm. telecommuting that you're doing as a face to a company or your own company or whatever and in, he, he mentioned that actually there's been a request to have multiple workstations in that space so that it's 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 not necessarily just one person it's either a person and an assistant or maybe it's a couple both have their own space um, whether they're working together or they don't uh, and then the media center was another one that they said, because it's acting like everything from a classroom for kids right now to a gathering space for families to, to, to a, you're, yeah, to you're driving me nuts. Please go spend four hours over there and get out of my hair. Right. right. And, and then the big one I thought was kind of fascinating was pantries and kitchens. Because well, yeah, the everybody's fact, going to the grocery store and cooking at home now. So, so entertainment is the prediction is that entertainment is going to be more in the home. You know, families are actually building memories. I've, I've, I have a couple of clients that, you know, I, I was very touched because their way of saying thank you for the kitchen design was they sent me pictures where they were cooking with their daughters. And like, you know, we're build, building memories, basically. Moms and daughters are building memories in the kitchen. Nobody's on top of each other. You know, grandma shows up. She can bake off on the corner. But the pantries, that those environments are going to become really interesting to see them evolve because we were going in a totally different direction before this. We were going into... I order everything, I eat out, I, you know, everything gets delivered and there's still a bit, a, a good amount of that. But I think we've gotten this a little bit more to your point, that nesting that's also taking place now. These homes are not just places where we go to sleep anymore. They are actually havens for us. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see what uh, comes out of this pandemic from a silver linings perspective, you know, yeah. what kind of sticks or carries over based on the way so many people have had to adapt over the last um, several weeks. So, uh, so maybe, what I, Megan, you could tell us a little bit about what inspires you and design and how when you are 
looking over the uh, applicants to be exhibitors at West Edge, what sticks out at you or what do you look for to, to show off for your attendees? Maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, sure, sure. So, you know, we try to have a diverse product category. So, you know, not too much of, of one element versus another. So we really try to segment. So that's one thing we look at. You know, we don't want to have um, the fair be 50% kitchen appliances. So uh, a little bit of everything um, to show diversity and, and add new elements to the mix. Um, I also look at the process. You know, what is the, the quality and the craftsmanship um, uh, of what's being manufactured um, and, and you know the the story behind the person that's always interesting too because we're, right. we're promoting the product just mm -hmm. as much as the individual maker um, and so we want to support we're a small business ourselves and we try to support local and small business and you know when I say local it's it's not just California but it's you know the craftsman up in Portland who is doing something in his or her garage studio um, and so that's important to us too, to kind of use the West Edge platform to get exposure for smaller companies too. But we look at, we look at things across the board, what's really unique and things that we maybe have not seen elsewhere. Um, because we know if we're not seeing it elsewhere, chances are our attendees are going to be equally intrigued um, by what we're showcasing. Um, and then, you know, for me personally, having moved to the West Coast, I'm very much a nature person. So um, organic shapes and the ocean and, and things like that appeal to me personally. So I always kind of get jazzed when I see um, things that have a, a, an organic or a natural kind of sense to them, even if that's a sustainability practice. And then don't you or do you have a particular concept or theme every year or is it just this fabulous vibe <laughs> that you have all the time. We, we don't necessarily have an annual theme. We get asked that question all the time and it's something that we've considered. Um, and I think, you know, maybe with everything that we've experienced recently, this connectedness or stay at home sort of mentality, that might be something interesting to consider moving forward. But we don't have a theme of the whole event. What we do have are new elements that we add each year. Mm -hmm. So um, last year in 2018, we had a section called Women's Work where we highlighted 13 female product designers. Um, you know, and we, we worked with Rob Report to be the media partner of that. And we promoted this collective of really innovative female right. makers designer so we try to do things like that each year where there's something new that's kind of themed along a certain uh, a certain segment of the market or, or something that's uh different than the year before yeah, that was one of the things that i remember uh because you know there's a variety of trade shows or things in the southern beaches here in orange county and the west edge had a higher in my opinion quality level of the products that you were showing to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do. I mean, we, we do cater to, you know, the higher end yeah. section of the market, but, you know, in the same way, while saying that, we also try to appeal to um, people who are just wanting to learn more. So we have a whole series of panel talks and design conversations. So even if you're not in the market for your second or third home, um, or a full-blown kitchen renovation, you can still come to the fair and get ideas. You know, it might be your first apartment um, out of school or changing the color of paint in your bedroom, things that are um, easy and perhaps more budget conscious, but still allow you to really improve and elevate your environment no matter, um, you know, where you are in the, in the process and in your learning of design. Megan, if you can maybe, this, this, let's just switch gears for a minute and talk about that. I really wanted to kind of basically also bring that to people's attention that are listening to the show is you had a very interesting configuration of panels. I mean, it, you had a variety in there. You had different mm -hmm. um, types of speakers, different backgrounds. It wasn't like just full, full on designer, designer, designer after each other. There, there was a certain celebrity component to it. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how that process is for you, because I was actually very intrigued by, by, by just the, the, 
I was I was disappointed I wasn't able to make it because you actually had it like you had the event, the opening, and then you had these things in the following days. Yeah. Uh, but it was really a, a very uh, intriguing composition. So could you talk to that? Sure. Yeah. So we think that the the educational component is is so important and. Uh, there are so many things that somebody can walk away with from an idea or a learning perspective. So we have started working with a, a media partner of our, ours called Convo by Design. So we co-produce our programming series with Convo by Design and all of our panels are actually uh, pushed out as podcasts after the fact. So um, Rod, if you didn't make uh, some of them, uh, you can still listen to the podcast and take I would love to. Yeah, but we... Um, we cater both to the design trade. So we have some you know, B2B programming, really talking about professional development for the design trade. And then our weekend talks cater to both the trade and the homeowner. So you know, something like um, you know, color trends for 2020 or how to make the most of your outdoor environment. Um, we do real estate programs. So I think that real estate and design go so mm -hmm. hand in hand. So everyone's always interested in you know, what's the forecast look like for the real estate market across the country and then in Los Angeles? So um, we do a combination of, uh, of talks that are, you know, professional development, uh, branding and marketing, things like that, as well as um, decorative for the homeowner or educational wellness and, and sustainability, how you can make your home more green. Um, you know, even if you're just getting started with, with what that really means, what is sustainability um, and what does that entail? So we try to really have a, a pretty diverse mix and our programs are every day. So it's, you know, you mentioned we open with an opening night party um, on a Thursday night and then Friday through Sunday are the show days with different talks going on throughout. And, and, and I think that was, uh, thank you for bringing that uh, back to my memory, because that was kind of the interesting thing also, is that you had almost crossed over, like you had real estate, you had design. I've rarely seen that combination on from a, from a sort of a um, expert position shared, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there there's like you mentioned wellness, for example, right? I mean, wellness, senior housing, um, residential, uh, you know, regiment of wellness, all of these things now cross over multi-unit, multi-unit development now is looking at bells and whistles, whistles and amenities that are basically wellness like, but not with attendees. I mean, there, there's such a hybrid happening um, uh, that, that it's, it's good to have somebody like you guys provide that crossover because it's rare that we see that. We don't really see that. There's all these little bubbles that basically function in their own spaces. It's nice to see somebody bringing them together. Well, I think it's it's partly a testament to the partners we work with too. You know, we've really made an effort to um, involve multiple trade organizations. So I mentioned the U.S. Green Buildings Council. Right. Uh, we also work with the Set Decorators Society. We work oh. with the American Society of Interior Designers, as Bill knows very well. So um, those organizations are very, very responsible for helping us curate the content and, and bringing us great ideas that that they feel are, are relevant and speak to the, um, you know, the interests of the market today. How long have you been doing what the show? What about the, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, how, how long have you been doing the show, Megan? We launched West Edge in 2013. So gosh, this is our eighth year, coming into our eighth year. So I'm sure as successful as it has been, you are, and you wanting it to keep it to a boutique size and, and sort of that offering, do you, do you struggle sometimes with like, do we grow it beyond a certain point? Do we do, because again, you know, the venue is like you said, you don't want to end up in like, you know, at the convention center in Vegas, for example, like is, is, do you, do you face those challenges? We, we do, you know, we do, we want to grow it, but we want to grow it um, carefully. So I, uh, and, and we definitely love our venue. So we want to, we want to figure out how we can grow and grow in a way that is relevant, but still maintains the vibe that you guys mentioned, you know, where you can see people and really have a great conversation and right. not feel, not feel like overwhelmed. Um, I think I mentioned using the outdoor space and I, I think there's a big opportunity to bring in more participants who are outdoor furnishings companies or outdoor mm -hmm. grilling brands or play up the culinary aspect um, in a bigger way or, or tie in 
um, the art world. So we've yeah. talked about a bunch of ideas um, as far as how we how we plan to grow um, in a way that's in line with our with our brand and our message. Awesome. Uh, it's you. also great for people watching. It I'm is <laughs> design. I mean, I you know I had a jacket on, but there were these people in these incredible outfits. So it was really wonderful to see that too. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Very L.A., like, we, as we say in Orange County, very L.A. Well, I mean, I was grinning when you said set designers because it's like, of course, you're in Los Angeles. You should, you're supposed to have set designers participate in something like this, yeah. right? Of course, of course. There's so many creatives. I mean, we're in, we're in a, a great place with uh, no shortage of creativity. So we try to incorporate um, as many of those great ideas and creative personalities as we can. How, how long does it take you for, for those who... Um, you know, get, like us, that, that get to experience the, the final output and product at the end. How long does it take you to put this together, Megan? So it's, it's funny, you know, we are running in a million directions right up to the opening of the event, as you can imagine. But we really, we, we work year round on this. So we are already um, taking notes and talking to prospects and talking to potential sponsors at one year's event for the following year. So um, we have a little bit of downtime. We run traditionally every October. So November and December are our months to really, you know, do all the, the post-show recap, press materials, um, follow-up. And then, you know, right after the new year, we are strategizing, coming up with, with selling and, and marketing right away. So it, it's pretty much a year a year long process. Yeah, I, I asked the question kind of knowing the answer, but I think a lot of people don't realize just exactly how much work goes into putting these okay. things on as say, very successfully. Yeah, and as much so, as we wish we could just show up the week of, it's it's not like that. <laughs> yeah, we have a very small, uh, it's called the Expo with ASID in Orange County. And we start right at January, uh, getting everything, actually in December, lining everything up. And we have this, we have this in the spring. But it's yeah. just one afternoon, whereas if you could let our viewers know the time frame, it's how many days over a weekend at the time? Yeah, yeah. We're a, we're a three-day fair um, with an opening night party. So we kick off um, on a Thursday night with a venue-wide opening night party. Um, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday are the event days. And, and this year it's scheduled for October? October 22nd through the 25th. How has the reception, how's it been, especially given what's going on, how has it, has it been received by those exhibitors? I mean, is everybody very excited to participate in yeah, this? Yeah, we, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a mix. Um, understandably, we have certain companies who are um, in a wait and see kind of scenario and, and kind of thinking about um, where they'll be in, in October. Um, looking at their budgets and, and trying to figure out what they're going to be doing in the fall. We have other brands who are so anxious to get back, you know, with all of the spring and summer trade shows and events that have been canceled, mm -hmm. we're getting a lot of feedback from people that everybody's going to be so hungry um, mm -hmm. come late fall, you know, assuming that, that, that the country is back open and, and that we don't have a resurgence of coronavirus in the fall, everyone's going to be ready to get back to, um, a place where we can engage with each other and, and kind of do business and start conducting business in, in a way that um, we were used to before. So we're getting, we're getting interest in contracts, uh, you know, right now. And, and we're also waiting and giving, giving some of our exhibitors a little bit more time, um, given the sensitivity around, around the current situation. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's very sensitive of, of anybody right now that's working with people. I mean, I think you have to be conscientious about the fact that they're dealing with stresses that are not necessarily your own and, and right. you know we get through this all together um what do you say and I, this is this has been kind of an ongoing conversation i think in the design industry when uh, from the moment that the internet came around it was like oh yeah everything can be sold on the internet everything you know it's like and i'm like uh i don't know if i can buy fabric on the internet i can't get you know like there's certain it's just so there's been all this all this there's been this ongoing kind of discussion and I think part of it, as when, when, especially with a lot of the events that had canceled or postponed or whatever, you know, because of COVID, um, there's a lot of people that are saying, you know, the future lies in virtual. So 
what do you think about that as being a veteran in this industry? Is there room for that? Is this going to be just a passing fad? What is it just limited to depending on what the, the product or the focus of the shows are? What do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, we've, we've been hearing this for years, um, you know, even with media, the print media going digital. And so it's, it's been this ongoing conversation. Now with virtual events, I, I think that that's, there's never going to be a replacement for a real event. And so what we're seeing is a lot of the digital initiatives and the virtual initiatives are a great supplement. And obviously we're all forced to, to adapt currently, but I don't see virtual replacing um, a, a trade show or an event when we are back to um, a situation where everybody can return to that in a safe manner. The, the products that we're working with and the companies that we're involved with are so tactile. Yeah. And uh, not only that, but we're talking about uh, products that are a, a bigger investment for someone. It's not, you know, a jacket or a piece of clothing. It's, right. you know, a, a kitchen, a piece of furniture, um, things that you're normally budgeting for um, a more significant amount of your budget. And I think with that, people really want to know um, what they're investing in. And, and of course, I don't think that's ever going to be only online without people wanting to really understand and be able to see firsthand and experience the company and get to know the maker, or the, the manufacturer. Well, what's funny is, yes, people may purchase online, but there's still a step that they take, which is basically a sampling. And so right. the, with a tactile product, it's always the convenience of maybe getting and receiving it by ordering it online. But you're not going to place that order without a tactile component. And when it comes to stuff like you guys are focusing on, which is innovative, uh, you know, interesting new things that people are doing, the artisan stuff, it, it's a little bit different. And I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think, I think it's never going to replace it. It's going to be interesting to see how it may be appropriately and effectively applied as a supplement, because that's, that can also be just very, very sort of uh, superficial. And then that could actually take away from a significance of a show. Like, if, oh, yeah, here it is. It's also there. So it's going to be interesting to see. Some people may actually walk away from it because it, their shows are so impressive, like yours, that basically doing a virtual component or an online component isn't just not going to be up to snuff, basically with the physical location. Yeah, I think it's a great addition or a supplement to, mm -hmm. to what the physical event is, but it's the same sense of, you know, you can watch a baseball game on TV, but if you're at the World Series, there's an emotional connection, there's an Excellent energy. Excellent point. And, you know, yes, people want to be a part of, part of that from an Experience. emotional and energetic perspective as well. So I know designers who, uh, don't want to travel now and their clients will do like a virtual uh, of their like their bathroom or kitchen and they'll send it or do a zoom meeting like this with the dimensions and then the designer will go and specify the products online and have the manufacturer send them to the designer like a variety of fabrics and stone and flooring and then they'll put the palette together and then send it off via the post or UPS it to the client so the client can actually see everything, yeah. prove it, sign it, and then the designer orders. You know, I think, I think more with more of us doing these Zoom meetings and Zoom calls and realizing that we can work and be pretty productive remotely, yeah. Yeah. I think that that is going to carry through. I mean, especially in LA, if I didn't have to get in the car and drive an hour. <laughs> So true. He's not happy to, to do something where we can talk online and, and hopefully have the same um, effectiveness to some extent. Yeah, I think quality, quality of life that people have experienced maybe uh, hopefully by um, being forced into this may actually make them even negotiate their job benefits in a different way. They may look at, uh, especially in places like you said in LA where, you know, you're committing to at least an hour to two hours of lost life every day basically commuting i mean you add that up at the end of the week and it's a full day that you know if you can cut that in half you get four or five hours of quality time that you now have basically regained what price do you put on that and then again all products all things are going to have to basically start addressing those mm -hmm. intrinsic needs and shifts in behavior 
Uh, so it's actually kind of a, you know, I, I, I look at people that are kind of down, down on, on, on things and, and, you know, in industry and stuff. And I, I remind them that it's moments like this that actually are very uh, powerful sometimes because their paradigm shifts in the way we approach things. Um, opportunities for innovation, opportunities to really kind of like say why not versus no or why. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm excited to see what you come up with this year. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting. Well, yeah, we're, excited, and we're excited to keep you guys posted <laughs> and to have you have you back with us and um, okay. you know, together yeah, I, again. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not even going to ask you to share anything, actually, uh, Megan, right now, because I really want to be surprised. Uh, but uh, yes, anything that you would like to, that, I mean, it's it's been wonderful to spend time with you. I think the show is an amazing show. Um, Anybody who has not been to it, they need to. And the website is right up there. Why don't you give people the website too, Megan, just in case? Yeah, yeah. Our website is West Edge Design Fair. And then you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at West Edge Design. And, and if for people who are interested in either exhibiting or participating maybe in the sessions, is, are they still open? Or is there opportunities still? There are still opportunities. There are still opportunities for for both. So um, on our website, we have our 2020 prospectus um, and additional information. Um, and then our programming series is in formation now. So we've got a couple weeks left. We're, we're in the process of really vetting what we want the content to look like. So there's opportunities for both. That's wonderful. You can purchase tickets on your website. You can. Our ticketing page is not up just yet, but yep. it will be. We normally launch the ticketing page in uh, July just around the corner. So, I mean, uh, no. yeah. uh, well, that's, that's great. So I, you know, again, I encourage everybody to attend the show at least, but if you're an exhibitor and you've got something unique, which a lot of people are pivoting their businesses and have been for the last couple of months. So I, I'm excited to see what's going to come out of people. I mean, I, you know, the distillery in Long Beach basically started doing hand sanitizers. I mean, you know, I, the, the list just goes on and on with people who are basically reinventing themselves, uh, adding more to what they're offering people. So please reach out to Megan, um, check out the show, check out their website. Um, mm -hmm. and, if, and even if you just attend the show, please make sure to, to mark your calendars at October 22nd to the 25th, right, Megan? Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you. Okay. We'll, we'll be there, for sure. We'll be there. Thank you so much for taking the time, Thanks, Megan. Megan. Thank you both. Nice chatting with you both. Likewise. Nice chatting with you. Thanks again. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.